Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Great singing. Now we're going to sing the B-I-B-L-E. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand along on the word of God. The B-I-B-L-E. Bible. Okay, let's do that again, except this time let's really yell. I know you guys can do better than that. Got to be loud. That's it. There's no kids up here now. All right, ready? The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand along on the word of God. The B-I-B-L-E. Bible. All right, if any, has anyone had any birthdays or anniversaries this week? <laughs> Any, any any anniversaries? No. All right. Let's move on to our next song, "Finding Jesus." Finding Jesus is my way, and when I find Him, I won't let go. Looking up, down, far and near, in Jeremiah it says, "Right here, and you shall seek." me and find me when you search for me with all your heart and you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart life's like wind or you are and sometimes we get sick and tired we still and know that he is god and in a still small voice he'll call and you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all find me when you search for me with all we are God's little people we got line we're gonna let it shine we are God's little people. God's little people are God's big people sometimes. Well, you may wonder what we think. Nyeth was a big, big man. He said, David, I'll kill you with my sword. But David brought him down to size. He laid that rock between his eyes. He said, I come in the name of the Lord. We are God's little people. We got line, we're going to let it shine. We are God's little people. God's little people are God's big people sometimes. Well, you may wonder what we can do with our skin, dumb knees, and tennis shoes. It may not look like we're worth a lot. But we are loved by God's own son That makes us big as anyone Just because we're not big doesn't mean we're not We are God's little people We got light and we're gonna let it shine We are God's little people God's little people are God's big people sometimes all right, Brother Ethan, would you lead us in prayer? And after that, we'll do all the things we learned. Couldn't hear him. Testing, testing. We there? Can you hear me? No. Oh. Okay. 
Mr. Cease, are you agitating today? You are here. I agree with that. And we are glad you're here. Okay, I got a couple of guys who are going to help me with the project. And uh, our normal teacher is in Selowit. And he and his bride and pastor are there to do mission work, to do Vacation Bible School, and to be sharing uh, the Word of God there. And so I am the substitute teacher. And substitute teachers can tend to get themselves in trouble real quick because they're number one substitute, which means they're just secondary. And secondly, because when the substitute teacher comes in and says, we're going to have a pop quiz, that adds to the stress, both for the teacher and those who are being taught. The guys are passing out an outline, and they're passing out some pens if you need it. And I'm going to encourage you today, this is one of those days, to, to, to go to school with me. Now, by the way, this service is called Sunday School. school. It is called Sunday School. So for me to use the term teacher as we do with Ken, that is uh, totally appropriate. And I'm going to take you, to some extent, all the way back to Bible College 101. Uh, if you study theology, if you read, I think, most any good theology book that I've ever read, uh, theo is God, and it's the idea of studying the logic or the concept of God. But most of any good theology book does not start with the first chapter being God. It starts with the first chapter being Bible. They start out with the first chapter being Bible, and there's a very important reason for that. Because the way we get to know God on a personal level, not just to look around us, as it says in Romans chapter 1, and see that there's something special out here, there's something special in creation, and, and as mankind's knowledge, now they say, is doubling every just every few years. They used to say, you know, 100 years, and then it was 50 years. And now, 20, and now they say with the technology we have that man's total knowledge is doubling just every few years. With all those things that are going on, it's a matter of trying to figure out, find out, understand about God. Now, a lot of people really struggle with finding out about God or believing God. I give people empathy at that point. Because, quite frankly, and I was thinking about this, and some of you know I've posed this question before, but when you think about, as we look around us, and we see that all we can see is our globe, and we see this little bit, and of course out here we've got the bay and the mountains, and we get to see more topography than most people because of the standpoint a lot of parts of the country and the world are flat. You can just see so many miles, and that's it. But we can see a long distance here, and like if you're in Anchorage, you can see Denali, you're... 100 and what, 125 miles away as a crow flies, and you can see it standing out there. But as you and I look at life, and you look at those things, and you talk to people about God, and you say there is a, there's a transcendent God out there that's big enough that he was able to just speak, and this place is like we see it. That he could speak and put, not millions, billions, but they say now trillions uh, we call them stars out there uh, in the sky, and he's bigger than those trillions of stars. All of that is, uh, can, can I be, just be fair, to human logic, that's very hard to grasp. So how do we find out about God? Romans 1 says we can look at the creation. We should see that there's something if you study the human body, if you study the human eye, which is one of the most fascinating, uh, next to the brain, the most fascinating part of a human body, uh, the capacity that your eye has and how it works. Uh, th there's something fascinating there. But I, uh, I could bring you back to the standpoint that if you're going to know God, if you're going to know about God, then you've got to know something about the book that he gave us to tell us about him. I uh, asked Gary the other night after the baseball game, I was on a motorcycle run by his place, and he was out 
picking on dandelions. What's Gary do? And th this is like 8, 8 o'clock at night. He's out there on his knees killing dandelions. But he came over and uh, we talked for a few minutes. And I said to him, I said, uh, Gary, pray for me because I got the privilege. I found out a few days before that I was going to be teaching Sunday school. And I had the privilege of doing that. But that. I wasn't sure just which direction to go. I've been praying about it. It's always, if I, at, when I was a pastor, I had the privilege of, you know, week in, week out, I could plan things, and I like series. I'm, I'm some, someone, some of you guys knows on our Wednesday morning Bible study that we have at 7 o'clock, breakfast Bible study, which you're welcome to. Uh, I like the technicality of things a lot of times. I like to see the trees as well as the forest. But I was praying about that, and I said to Gary, pray for me, and I went home that night, still praying, thinking about when I went to bed, and I woke up, uh, well, actually, before I went to bed, these words came to my mind, oh, how I love thy law. I want you to turn with me to the book of Psalm 119. Psalm 119. I started a series a, a long time ago on a bird's eye view of the Bible. We got our bus just rolled up. We should have some more coming in, including Drew. But I started a series on the bird's eye view of the Bible, and I start out by talking about uh, the subject we're going to talk about today, which I've kind of worked on more even the last couple days on this. Uh, but then I started going through a bird's eye view view of each of the books of the Bible, and I'd like to do that with you. I kind of did that a little bit with First Peter a while back when I gave you an introduction. But I want you to come with me to Psalm 119, which is a, a familiar passage of Scripture, which has all these verses, and they all talk about the Word of God. It starts out, blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they who keep his testimonies and seek him with a whole heart. They also do no iniquity if they, walk in his, if they walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Now, I want you to, with that in mind, just think about this. Where here, here's a, a chapter, and I'll deal with it a little bit more later, but has all these verses, and every verse in all this longest chapter of the Bible, in the biggest, longest book of the Bible, every verse has the concept of the Word of God and driving home that. In verse 9, it says, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed there to according to thy word. A young man, that time of life when mind and emotions and testosterone is thinking of a man uh, and that's going on. And we can say this in a generic sense. And obviously with gals, it's all kinds of going, things going on. How can he cleanse his mind? He says, by taking heed to the hear of God. And then he says, with my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Verse 11 is one that we teach our children from the youngest age. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. In verse 47, it says, and I will delight myself in the commandments which I have loved. Verse 97, and this is the verse that the Lord brought to my mind as I was praying about, where are we going to go? Where do, you, where do I get to take your people today? Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Now, I don't want to sound super spiritual here and say to you, and I don't think the psalmist is saying that the only thing and everything they thought about was the word of God, but what he was saying, as I walk through life day in and day out, your word continues to speak to me. It continues. It's my, and I love it because it speaks to me. How I love thy law. Go to verse 161. Princes have persecuted me without a cause, but my heart standeth in what? Awe. My heart standeth in awe of thy word. We pulled up this morning and parked out here, and I saw one of the tour boats parked out here, which means there's probably some kind of animal, there's some kind of fish, some kind of whale, whatever term you want to use, is probably out here because they're parked looking at something. I was talking to someone the other day as I'm out in our lawn business. I meet a lot of people along the way, 
and I, and I try to talk to them. It's kind of interesting because I, you know, like to find out where they're from, and they're looking around. And uh, we were cleaning out the sewer real estate on Monday, and just as we were finishing up that night, this uh, couple come walking into the parking lot. I had my back turned. They'd actually parked out the front. They walked in my parking lot, and this gal's got one of these huge cameras with a lens. You know, that lens is like this big around. And they're looking, and if you're familiar there across from the old SBS, there's an eagle's nest. And there's an eagle there, and they're trying to take th these pictures. And so I just walked over to them and, you know, spoke, introduced myself, and and the guy was real apologetic. Oh, I'm sorry, we, 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 I know we're on your property. I said, no, you're not on our property. We're just here cleaning up the property. But uh, he was, they were taking pictures, and I told him, I said, you know, I don't know if you'll get the privilege I did, but just a couple of days ago, out about mile four, where you got the welding shop out there, on the other side of the road, I got, I think, about at least 25 eagles within 75 yards. I, that's the most I've ever seen here. But they were in awe of one eagle and a nest. And I got to see 18 of them. But that's awe. And you look at these mountains, and many times people just look at them and they're just in awe. Well, that, that's what the psalmist said, his attitude he found in the Word of God. And led by the Spirit of God, he says, in awe. He says in verse 162, I rejoice at thy word as one findeth great spoil. Jesus talked about a parable about the the guy that sees, finds a treasure in the field and goes and buys it, pays everything he has to get it because he knows there's a treasure. There's a great treasure in the scriptures. Verse 163, I hate and abhor lying, but thy law do I love. Seven times a day do I praise thee because of thy righteous judgments. And then verse six, 165 is one that many people have memorized when you think about it, but great peace have they that love thy law. Verse 167, Thy soul hath kept thy ten, uh, testimonies, and I have loved them exceedingly. Now, I'll give you all that from the standpoint that the Word of God is classically important. When I talked to you, I mentioned a few moments ago about the individual who's struggling with thinking that there's a God so big he could do all of this. And then there's a God so loving that he would be willing to send his son, the son would be willing to come, and the Holy Spirit would be willing to lead to him going all the way to the cross to pay for your and my sin so we could have salvation. That's awesome, friend. That's awesome. How do you find out about that happening? There it is. So, the Bible is the most phenomenal, important, and dynamic book ever written. It is not cold and dusty book of antiquity. It literally is alive and life-changing. So I want you to walk with me, and we'll go as far as we can today. And if I get a chance, I'll pick up from here and go another time even farther. And if you have the outline, I encourage you to, to write down things and just kind of keep up. But a few practical perspectives about the Bible. Now, this is, some of these I've borrowed from people as common statements, but I want you to get this picture. Under A, it says, it is, and you have a blank there, it is the mind of God revealed to the mind of man. It is the mind of God revealed to the mind of man. And by the way, if you get behind, uh, I, I, won't, I will gladly let you look at my outline. There's nothing here. I have left it hidden because I found over the years, uh, when I was in grade school, we didn't, we didn't call it middle school in those days. It was grade school or high school. I really wasn't interested much in learning. And when I got saved and God took me out to Bible college, I, I was in deep trouble because I hadn't been interested in learning. So I had to work harder than anybody else, and I figured out something real quick. One of them was if I sat at the front of the class, although I sat in the back here, but it's not very far back, there's less distractions at the front. The second thing I learned is I need to take notes. Because my memory might not work good, but my notes will help me keep things. And they always say, if you hear it, see it, and write it, you're about, what, five times more likely to remember at least part of it. So as we go through, just know I'll give it to you. Under B, its teachings are holy. That would be the idea of pure. Its rules, binding. Its history is true. 
its decisions unchangeable. Its teachings are holy, its ruling, rules binding, its history is true, its decisions are unchangeable. Now you and I are living in a world today that it's almost hard for me in some ways to fathom, not only because of the awesomeness of our world and the globe around us, but I am, I am tragically appalled at the rapidity of the decline of our world, and especially this country. Now, I, I love our country, and God has given us great gifts in this country. But right now, you and I are on the cusp of seeing a church like this have to go underground. And I'm not trying to be an alarmist, I'm trying to be a realist. When you walk up to someone, and you, because you care about them, when you walk up to someone and you say to someone, and Scott likes to say, do you know for sure you're going to have it? Uh, the problem is, if you're not sure you're going to go there, the Bible only gives one other alternative. What's the other alternative? You go to hell. All right? If you walk up to someone today and say, if you walk up and say, you're going to hell. What response are you going to get? Huh? Yeah. If you're lucky, it's a slap. Might be knuckles. But what are we talking about? What do you hear all the time? That's hate speech. You hear about a lot of different things. But think about this. If this situation keeps going like it is, for you to stand up and tell someone you're going to hell, if you go up and tell someone Jesus is the only way, to heaven. Now, just let me say, now, the atheists will say, well, I don't believe in heaven, I don't believe in hell. Well, although interesting, if they get in trouble, it's amazing how often they'll, they'll, they'll pray or they'll say to you, pray for me. But, but if you walked up to a Muslim and said to them, Jesus is the only way, Muhammad is of the devil. If you approach it that way, what is that person going to do? Well, if you're in some places, you think about this sword that's kind of curved like this because it kind of goes like that, and they take that sword in a <laughs> type situation because you have just challenged them with a statement, and how are you going to back that statement up? They can say, it's your opinion. Don't you hear that? A lot of times when you get to talking to people about spiritually, well, well, that's your opinion. And they used to say, by the way, uh, just a few years ago, it was when I was first saved 55 years ago this month, you could, you could talk to people frequently, even, you know, about that and, and talk about God and this type of thing, and people would accept that and they, and they would acquiesce to it. In fact, they were embarrassed if they, they would keep their mouth shut if they didn't agree with you to where we're at today. But when you use the idea that that's hate speech because you made me feel uncomfortable, you tell someone they're on their way to hell unless they accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, my friend, you have made them uncomfortable. And if the Spirit of God's working in their life, when the Spirit of God began to work in my life, I'm running from God. He's chasing me. Uh, that, that was a part of the thing, but that's the place that we are coming to in our country. So my friend, you better understand this book. And when you're talking to people, we talk about apologetics, defending things. It's not just a, a normal thing, but you need to have some facts. So that's what I'm trying to do. The Lord has allowed me to think through this and, and that. So as you think about this, there's a popular acrostic that many of you have seen before. I'll just mention it quickly. That, uh, that popular acrostic is Bible, and it's basic information before leaving earth. Well, that's a good, I don't have no idea where it started, but I've seen it for years. Basic information before leaving earth, Bible. Basic information before leaving earth. Now, by the way, as you're penning away there, because I'm being a mean substitute teacher, 
and making you work and hopefully making you think. Well, on this subject of acrostics, I just had you in Psalm 119. This is, like I say, probably the most the famous of the Old Testament chapters in the Bible by many people. Now, some of you already know the construction, but let me give this to you. This great chapter has 22 sections. If you look there, if you start out at the very beginning of that chapter, you'll see if your Bible's like mine, it starts out with Aleph, and then it goes, if you look at verse 9, Beth, and then in verse, uh, I'm skipping over here, 17, Gimel, and then 25, Daleth. Those are the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And when you go through this chapter, you'll find there's 22 sections because there's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Each of these sections begin with a succeeding letter of the Hebrew alphabet, not just in the title, but actually in the words that are used. Add to that that each section has eight lines, and each of these lines begin with a word that starts with the same letter of the alphabet. Are you thinking with me about this now? How many verses are in this chapter? How many verses? 176. Every verse, every letter of the Hebrew alphabet, 22, each has eight lines. Each of those eight lines, those eight statements, starts with that same letter of the Hebrew alphabet and goes through. I was reading something one time a man who was involved in linguistics. And if I remember right, this particular one I'm thinking about was not a believer. But because he liked literature and linguistics, he had been challenged to look at Psalm 119. And basically he came back and said, I have no, I can't imagine someone being able to sit down and write out this chapter, the technicality of that, the technicality of that was astounding to him. Now, I, we won't turn there, but let me mention there's another acrostic when you think about acrostics, and that's, again, the take a letter and make a statement of each one. The book of Lamentations, we won't turn there. This book, which contains five, and this is a good title of it, Funeral Dirges. The book of Lamentations. Uh, and by the way, I would tell you, you know, some people are real happy-go-lucky and some people are more serious. I kind of I kind of see myself somewhere kind of in the middle of that. But, you know, some people are just, you know, bubbly all the time and other people are just more Eeyores and kind of down all the time or, or at least, you know, pretty solemn and, and, and whatever. And you never, you never quite know if they like you or not because they don't give you you know, any indication. My wife and I were just talking about that, uh, the idea of wearing a mask, you know, trying to communicate with people. We were, we went on an Anchorage run. We hadn't been up there for months, me, for been quite a while. But we went up yesterday and let her shop till she dropped. That was <laughs> trying to be a good husband here. And, uh, and she kind of got to the place at the end, she thought, my feet, are, my feet are about done, you know. But she was remarking the fact that the friendliness of the people in Alaska as a whole. Now, there are some places in that way, but, but it was just interesting. We're, we stopped at the local burger man, used to be known as the Roadrunner, and had one of their famous smoked turkey sandwiches, which you've not been there, you've not eaten that, you got to try it. When my mom was alive, when my mom flew into Anchorage, the very first day she wanted to go to that place and have a turkey sandwich. And the last day before she got on the plane, she wanted to go and have that smoked turkey sandwich. My wife are there sitting outside along the water, beautiful day. We're actually sitting in the, listen to me, shade. <laughs> and she complained, by the way, she complained going and coming because we're in a hot car because we've used our air conditioning so little it wouldn't work yesterday. <laughs> and when you tried to turn it on, it was blowing hot air at us. But my point is we're sitting here and we're eating our turkey sandwich and this gal goes walking by, and then she turns around and comes back and leans over, kind of leans into us and says, what was the actual word I'm trying to think? That, well, anyway, that, the idea, that's a really good sandwich. Now, if you went to New York City, 
Now, I've been just in the area very shortly or Washington, D.C., and you walk down the sidewalk, what do most people do? They will. And if you're, if you're there, they almost look away. They don't, they don't want to get eye contact. You know, that we're not, we teach our kids now because it's a more cruel world. We teach our kids, you know, be careful when somebody's, you know, looking you in the eye, talking to you, this type of thing. What a tragic thing. But my wife was saying, with a mask, you know, it's really hard to, to see a person's emotions. You can see their eyes, but you, if you look at it, it's really hard without the mouth to go ahead. Are they smiling at me? Are they frowning at me? Are they happy? Are they sad? Whatever else it is. But it was so great to go to Anchorage, and we had a few people that had their mask on, but 99% uh, of the people didn't. And, and you go to the store, and people will start talking to you in the checkout line and sometimes teasing you about what you got in the cart. Now, I understand there's not a lot of places in the world that, that happens. But as you and I think about it, some people teach that, well, Christians, it's just a good, happy time all the time. If you're a believer, uh, you know, we were listening to a little bit of a broadcast this morning, and there was a song there. It was like, if you just believe everything's going to be great, you're going to be healed, you're going to be this, you're going to be that, and all these type of things. Uh, my friend, that's just not what this book teaches. In fact, in this chapter, he'll talk about being persecuted, and he runs to the law. Lamentations is a book given to us which means lament or cry by Jeremiah, who's called the weeping prophet. And it has five chapters, five sections now. Now think about a crossing, a letter, and then you have things that go along with it. It is this five that related to the death of Jerusalem and their inhabitants in this alphabetical acrostic. When the Bible scholars begin the task of making our chapters and verse, and this is something I just want to add in here, when they began the, take, began the task of making chapter and verse separation, this book outlines easily five times the Hebrew alphabet is gone through. Listen, five times the Hebrew alphabet is gone through. Here is what I mean. Each chapter begins with the first letter of the Hebrew, the A, as we would sing, or Aleph. Then each verse following begins with the next letter, and the next letter, and the next number. So there's 22 that you find. Now, the construction of that, grammatically, this is a shorter book, but that takes a lot of thinking. Now, I like alliteration, and sometimes we who like to alliterate, uh, we kind of make it difficult to translate. Because we use words. I'm going to use one a little bit later here, perpetuity. Isn't that a nice word? Makes you sound intellectual, doesn't it? I have perpetuity. Okay? You and I, as we look at those things, we find that the scriptures is phenomenal. Now, there's two key words related to the transmission of the word of God. And these will be familiar to you, and we're going to school here, so I've got to go back. It's 101, so we've got to make sure we lay down the basics. The first word is revelation. Revelation. And what does it mean? What does revelation mean? What does reveal to you mean? What's revelation mean? It could be, but that's not the main focus. That would be like in the beginning God. When you talk about, yes, Beth. Okay, you're revealing something that wasn't known before. Uh, you're opening up something so somebody can understand what's out there. Revelation, God makes visible or understandable something which otherwise could not be known. Literally, the Greek word means to, and the word re reveal or revelation means to make, lay bare, make naked, disclose, manifest. We have a book called Revelation. It is not the revelation of John or the Apostle John. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. What is that telling us? God is revealing something to us that could not otherwise be known. And you go into Revelation is talking about Jesus 
And you pick him up in the first chapter as the glorified Jesus that was seen after the resurrection. And John was allowed to see there. You have this phenomenal. Uh, and and I, you, some of you heard me say this. I've said it here before. Uh, all, these, all these movies that are out there, these uh, superhuman, supermen, superwomen, you know, all these things that you see there, uh, they're, they're all in some ways copycats of what the scripture is, but putting to someone else, putting it to some, you know, sci-fi situation. Because when you meet Jesus in Revelation chapter 1, uh, he, he, at this point, he is no longer that lamb of God. He is the king of kings, and he glows, and his feet glow, and his eyes are, are like fire. And when you think about the, you know, the fire-breathing dragon that has the eyes that look like fire, that's, they, they cop, they're, they're taking that concept from the scriptures and put it into something else. But it's to reveal, to disclose, to manifest. Listen to Galatians chapter 1. Don't turn there. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it. But it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. How did I get what I've got? How did I get this writing to the, to the believers in Galatia? Paul doesn't say, you know, folks, I got something really important. I want to tell you what I've been thinking about. He literally says, I got something very important that God knows, and now he wants you to know it. That's revelation, and that's how it's used. Second word, inspiration. Inspiration. What does inspiration mean? What does inspiration, I'm mainly teaching, so I'm not giving you a lot of time to talk, but what does inspiration mean? Even in just a general word, how would we define that, apply that? Got everybody scared off here? What? Okay, getting in the more technical side, the word breath is the word that's used. In, in the Greek language, in the Old Testament, it has a word that's similar to that, the I- idea of breathing, and it's not the idea of just, as our dear Bonnie here tried to play, scare us all a little bit a few days ago. Her problem was she was not breathing like she should. The breath, and the breath here has the idea of you breathe out Statements, you speak statements, inspiration. Both the Old Testament and New, like I say, is there. And it's using the compound word connected to God. Literally, it would read like this. It just you look at it. Inspiration, that original word, God breathed. God breathed out. God spoke. God spoke. Second Peter 1, 20 and 21, knowing this first, and I just kind of hit the highlight of it. That no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Now you start to talk to someone and you start to tell them, well, the Bible says this, or and, and, and we go if we go this way and we say, Well, now, now folks, I believe the Bible teaches. Now that's not it's not that you can't say that. But what's the antagonist and the skeptic say, Scott? We hear this, haven't you heard that? Well, even when it comes to the Bible, you pick up your Bible and you start to share the Word of God and you say, well, the Bible teaches. And even if you use the verses there, uh, in fact, there's one subject, and I'm not going to get into it today, but, but there's people I know that take the very same verses and, and basically they, they literally turn the, the words on their end. They turn them upside down to say the very thing that it condemns, that it supports. And how do you get in that situation? Because you've gone to your private, personal in, in, uh, inspiration. You've gone to that idea that this is what I, and that's the danger. It's much better to say, well, the Bible, think about it. I believe the Bible. Now, I'm not saying, in this case, I'm, that's one sentence, but I'm saying two different approaches. And when you start out with, I believe, then they can come back and say, well, I believe. You say, well, the Bible says it. If you're not a believer, 
Hey, Arthur is home. Everybody, Arthur is home. Hey. Hey, buddy. It says, no prophecy of scriptures of any private interpretation. For that prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And by the way, it's interesting, one word there is used that ties with that is a mariner's term. And it's a mariner's term for if, you have a, if, you have a, if you're out here and you have a boat and you're trying to fish in the same spot, what do you have to do? Anchor. You want to stay there? And if, if you got a really, really bad storm and you're trying to, you're out around the Cape someplace and it's really battering, you try to find yourself a cove as quiet as possible and then you anchor. And if you don't have an anchor, you try to get someplace close enough to shore that you can throw a rope up and tie it to a tree. When it talks about this no private interpretation, the concept there is to, that, the, that don't pull up the anchors. No, what it means is, look at the context. The words are there in a context. And I've got something I'll share with you here in just a minute that's not in your notes. It's very important. When you're talking to people and you're dealing with the scriptures, uh, don't just take one verse out or one word out because you can be susceptible to most any teaching or start out any teaching, and even though you might desire to be truthful, you will not be. It's of no private interpretation. You keep the anchors. You anchor it around because it's not only individual words, but it's context. And I'll share with you what I mean by that. By the way, uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, part of that says, All Scripture is given by what? Inspiration of God. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Under this subject, now this is not in your notes, so I'm just going to tell you that there, I, as I was kind of tweaking on things, I got thinking about this. There's a concept that you often find when you're talking about the scriptures and you're talking about transmission of scriptures, you'll hear the term verbal plenary inspiration of scriptures. Verbal plenary inspiration of scriptures. Now, that sounds kind of scary, but it's not. But it helps us understand our Bibles. In defining inspiration, we would say, as Bible believers, our position is, we believe in the verbal plenary inspiration of Scripture, at least I do. Verbal, verbal means every word. Every word of the original Scripture is given by God and thus not only important, but pertinent. Now, some of you know that I, I'm not, and I, I'm being dead honest, I'm not a Greek scholar, Hebrew scholar. I struggle with those things. I use the tools. It's been a long time, a lot, of, a lot of years since I was in Bible college even, and that. But I do enjoy dabbling in the original words because that's how God says we should. The guys knowing the Bible say, I'll come make a reference to something. But, but let me say something. As important it is to have some concept, and there's all kinds of tools out there that you can use. My Faith Life Bible, uh, Blue Letter Bible, a lot of different programs. You can go and you can pick a word and you can click on it, and it's going to give you the background of that word. and that. Uh, but a friend of mine who I went to seminary with, who was straight A's Greek and Hebrew, that friend of mine, one of the things he said to me is, and, and he was what I would classify as a scholar at that point, uh, he said, the more I study the original languages, the more I appreciate my English Bible. And so I want, to, I want you to think about that, but let me also say this. As you think about your English Bible, it's important at times to look at the words because they will carry out... They'll, they'll reveal, they'll open up something that gives you a little bit better understanding of what the Scripture is talking about. In that aspect, 
Verbal means every word. Now, what about plenary? Not a word that we, verbal we use some, plenary we don't usually use. But here's what it means. It means all parts of the Bible are divinely accurate and authoritative. Now, that's important. All portions, all parts. Now, by the way, when you're reading through your Bible and you come to this long list of names that we call a, what? Nope. Names, personal names. Genealogy. What is a genealogy? Is tracing your family history from here to here to here to here to here. When we go through the genealogies, uh, and I don't want to sound again super spiritual, I'm going to tell you like I go through every time and I read through uh, the things, but, but by the, especially in the New Testament, when you think about Matthew and Luke's genealogy, it's very interesting, some of the inclusions and exclusions that are in those genealogies. But understand that the genealogies are there from God for very specific and important reasons. And to be a person who just gets there, says, nah, even, even if I don't have to pronounce it, you, you're in a study someplace and somebody asks you to re read a, you know, uh, scriptures and you're in a genealogy. Now, I don't like doing that. You know, you, you chop and you know, mango and do whatever those names. But understand this, because we believe in verbal plenary, not only the individual words, but the concepts are important and authoritative. Here's one, Blue Letter Bible, by the way, and you can, this is free, you can pull it up. Here's a statement they made. Therefore, the phrase verbal plenary inspiration means that all parts of the Bible says exactly what God wanted said. He guided the entire process so that the end result would be His words. That's a good statement. Therefore, the, the phrase verbal plenary inspiration means that all parts of the Bible says exactly what God wanted said. He guided the entire process so that the end result would be his words. Now, with that in mind, let me pose a question to you. Why is there so much variety in even the structure and the words used in the various books of the Bible? I'm making you think, I realize, but it is 10.30, so by now you should be coming out of your night stupor <laughs> and with thinking here. Why isn't it, if every word and the phrase it's in is given in the original language by inspiration of God, it's the revelation from God, why isn't it all identical? As Ken says, I stop talking means... Why isn't it? Maybe translation and Bible, because when our Bible text comes all at once, it only contains the double other translation of the other writers. Well, what I'm talking about here in the, is the situation of if God breathed, if God spoke, if God breathed, and he chose the, in, the specific word and the context or phrase, that's, let's say a phrase or sentence that's put in, if God chose that, then why, if it's coming from God, I mean, some of you know me, and you would say, well, I know, you know a little bit of Ron, and I know a little bit of how he thinks, because when he gets up and starts teaching or preaching or whatever, you know, this is, and, and my illustrations come from my background in that. Why is it all the same? If somebody's dictating, if you, my wife's first, um, first job out of high school was for president of a small company. I, I could go through a litany of the Gates Learjet, vice president, she was secretary too at one point, others were there. My, and by the way, I never, ever, ever, ever play Scrabble if I can help it with my wife. My, my personal insecurities come out. <laughs> yeah. Scott. Catch that? 
God is God, and he's able to do things that you and I cannot do. But he's able to come down, and, and to some extent, it's, a, it's not the same thing, but it, is, it has a, com- a parallel. I'm, I'm speaking, Scott's going to speak, Tom's going to preach, pastor's preaching over in Selowick and, and that, but the different people are here, Ben, the different ones here have taught and maybe preached. We're all, we're all, hopefully, coming from the same source, the Word of God. But isn't it fascinating how differently we can approach even the Scriptures and how we deliver them? The thinking mind, thinking now of a non-believer, and you say to them, we believe, I believe in the verbal plenary inspiration of Scripture, the word dictation would come to mind, and when you, my wife was taking dictation, her job was not to just kind of, you know, you, you just make up what you want to say. Your idea was you're taking that person's words and putting it, then typing out in the letter, so when the person gets the letter, if they know you, they know that that sounds like you. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. Gospels? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. The first the first three gospels we call synoptic gospels, synonym. The idea of they're basically following the same pattern. Uh, John goes to a different pattern, but the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, we're studying in our men's Bible study. We're in John 11 now where Lazarus gets raised from the dead. The interesting thing about that, that's one of the, one of the favorite uh, accounts in Scripture. I'm trying, to use, I'm trying to force myself not to use the word story. The episode is good. And, I, and there's a reason for that, by the way, when I say story, because... When you have children and, and you're getting ready to put them to bed and you, you say, let me tell you a story. Let, let's say the three little pigs and the big bad wolf. That's a story. Now, I would tell you that I drove my children and my grandchildren, I have a tendency when we've done it, drive them crazy because when I tell the story, it goes something like this. There were three little wolves and a big, bad pig. <laughs> and I can remember my grandchildren literally going up, putting his hands on my face and saying, Papa, that's not what it says. <laughs> oh, well then let me tell you the story of the three little wolves and the big, bad pig. <laughs> oh, literally, I got that response from one of my grandchildren. As you, and I, as you and I think about this process, if somebody's dictating, it would sound, you, when Sally would send the letter, it needed to sound like the person who was sending the letter, not Sally. But when God came to do the inspiration of Scripture, by revelation and inspiration, he steps in and he allows people to put their personality, their vocabulary, by the way, and I, I won't even use this, their emotions will come out. John Mark, in the Gospel of Mark, there's one word that he uses frequently that I don't think any other writers use at all, other synoptics. It's the word immediately. Just read Mark, immediately. They're going along and uh, immediately and immediately. And some believe that's why when John went out on that first missionary journey with Paul and Barnabas, some believe that it wasn't he was scared off, but it just wasn't moving fast enough for him. I don't know. But you see the emotions. You see the personality. And that's what you have to understand. And it is hard to, to, for people to understand, but you've got to present the truth in that situation. By the way, uh, 
Matthew. If you want to take a gospel writer and say, uh, how does his lifestyle show up even in his gospel that God let him write? What was Matthew's profession before he became a disciple and an apostle? A tax collector. Uh, now, to some extent, he's our Gary. How many months have you been saved? How many months have you been saved? How, how many months have you been alive? How many months have you been alive? Okay, all right. His mind goes that way, those figures. Now, some of you say, how in the world? I don't know. But he's got to count on all dandelions. He hadn't named them yet, but he's got 5,000 and some. He's got his bucket of his enemies over there in the bucket he was telling me about the other night. Yeah, 127 in that bucket. In that bucket, see? All right. He's a counter. And it shows up in what he says and how he looks at life. Okay? Who wrote Psalm 23? Humanly. Who? David. David. And what was David's profession prior to what? A shepherd. David understood. When you read Psalm 23, if you study Psalm 23, it is absolutely phenomenal how he takes from his background, led by the Spirit of God, things that he knew that a shepherd, a good shepherd, would do. And God, the Holy Spirit, allows him then to take and pen that for you and I to learn from today. Solomon. If I said, with Solomon and the book of Proverbs, what is the key word for Proverbs? Wisdom. Wisdom. He is driven by the need for wisdom. What's the difference between wisdom and knowledge? What's the difference between wisdom and knowledge? What's that? Application. Knowledge is knowing facts. Wisdom is the ability to take facts and put it into practice, even on the common things. If you're doing some carpentry work, knowledge is to know, you know, you got a plane or you've got, you know, a power drill, you got this and that and the other thing. Wisdom is to be able to take those different pieces and put them together to build a cabinet or something. That's the difference between the two. In chapter 4 of Proverbs, if you go back there and check, David, or Solomon says, these are the words that my father taught me. And what did he teach him? He said, Solomon, get wisdom. With all your understanding, get wisdom. God comes along to Solomon and gives him three choices. Great riches. We'd say fame or wisdom. Why did Solomon choose wisdom? Because his dad had drilled in him the importance of wisdom. Yes. Yeah. When, you're, when, when he got away from God later in life, when he was not walking close to God, vanity, vanity, all things are vanity. What a difference between Proverbs in Ecclesiastes, what a phenomenal difference, the different times of his life. And that's one of the things that I pray for, it being three-quarters of a century. Some of you know my prayers that I would finish well. I'd like to finish with my right mind. Well, I've, I've got part of it yet, but I'm losing it faster than I, I want to say. But he said, my dad told me, get wisdom. Now, I, I want to close with that because we'll, if I get an opportunity to teach again, I'll come back to this. But I want you to think about the fact that God, in inspiration, was able through the individuals and their vocabulary, their emotions, their, he was able to communicate the exact words and context to tell us. Thus saith the Lord. Father, thank you for the day you've given to us. And Father, you know, it, it challenges and encourages and refreshes my mind to go back and, and study again some of these things. And Lord, I pray you'd help me to be able to communicate so that the people here 
as well as myself, can gain a greater understanding, but not just an understanding, not just facts. But even the wisdom to take the word and apply it. And Lord, I thank you for that privilege. I thank you for the service, the hour to come. And Father, be with Brother Tom. And, and Father, just again, the others who will be speaking today, we just pray that you would use this day in a way that you could touch lives, including mine. And thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.